All right. Um, so today, uh, it's so funny how often I am trying to think of what's the what what should we talk about? And to be honest, I love more than anything is when everyone throws out questions. And so start putting your questions in the Q and A uh, so we can get to them all. And I can also judge uh, how much of this you guys want me to be talking about. Um, one of the things I'm now trying to pull it up here. There it is. One of the things, uh, and it's been a while since I've talked about this, but in a relationship, we all take uh, different roles. Um, and, you know, we've talked in the past about like the drama triangle and that's like Cartman's drama triangle. I've actually, uh, I have a buddy of mine, Troy Love, who also does um, videos for Seeking Integrity. He's added and changed the triangle a little bit. It's actually more of a square. Uh, and so we, we take these different roles. But one of the things that when we fight, when we have disconnection, uh, let, me, let me change it. When we have conflict, and I always try and teach people that conflict is a wonderful thing in a relationship if we are able to see that it's an opportunity for repair. Um, if we can repair conflict, we increase attachment. So we don't want to create drama. We don't want to create conflict. But if we can start to see conflict as an opportunity for increasing trust, increasing attachment in the relationship, it can be a really positive thing. But, but we have these two roles within a relationship where generally we are acting as a pursuer and we're seeking out the other person for connection um, now the person who is not the pursuer so either i pursue and then you get upset and you pursue me back and then we're in the dance or the negative cycle that sue johnson refers to as find the bad guy um, or i pursue you and you withdraw. Now, a pursuer often feels like they're dying in here. They're shut out. They're, they're starving. They feel like their feelings don't matter, that they're lonelier than living alone. They feel like they're by themselves. They're dismissed. I get no response, even though I yell to get a response, any response. I don't matter. We're only roommates, right? Because to them, the withdrawing partner is abandoning them. Now, for my betrayed partners, if you happen to be female, um, this is probably most likely your, your uh, partner struggling with addiction uh, as a male tends to be more of a withdrawer Plus, they've been involved with addiction, compulsivities, and that naturally uh, creates isolation and disconnection in a relationship. So you might feel as though I'm speaking to you. And it was interesting because last session, I had several, uh, Tammy and I were doing the discussion, and I had several people who were like, oh my gosh, you get me, right? And then and then uh, somebody else chimed in and was like, yeah, as an, or, or as an addict or you get me. Right. And so it was like this weird space where you both felt like I understood you. And and the truth is, that's my goal as a couples therapist. I want both people to feel like I understand them. What's funny is people will tell me all the time, you get me, but you've got my partner all wrong. <laughs> and the other person's like, no, no, you get me perfectly, but you've got my partner all wrong. And so it, it makes me laugh. But the withdrawing partner feels like I can never get it right. No matter what I do, I can't please you. I try to fix and it doesn't work. You don't appreciate that I'm trying to fix it, right? Uh, I give up. I space out. It's best to avoid a fight, try to keep things calm. So the withdrawing partner is like doing everything they can to be the rational one in the relationship. And keep in mind, in their mind, rational is no conflict and no emotion, <laughs> typically. Um, 
the the withdrawing partner feels like they're failing the withdrawing partner feels frozen often the withdrawing partner gives a still face as if they're there they might be looking at you and blinking but they can't uh they're not tuned in uh they want to go behind their wall they want to numb out and so the withdrawing partner is trying to save the marriage by being calm by preventing the fight, by ignoring the fight, if that makes sense. And so if we understand uh, from the research uh, in a heteronormative relationship, 75% of women are pursuers and 25% of men are pursuers. So 75% of men are withdrawers, so on. So. Um, now, it doesn't mean we can't both be pursuers. It doesn't mean we can't both be withdrawers. But we tend to develop a, a pattern or a role uh, of a pursuer or a withdrawer. And it leaves us in all of these emotions about feeling like I'm doing everything I can and it's not enough. Um, I'm lonely and, and my partner doesn't want to connect. And so just wanted to kind of throw that out as a bit of education, understanding those two roles. And what I love about both of those roles is that both people are intending to actually help the relationship forward, whereas a withdrawer feels smothered by a pursuer and a pursuer feels totally abandoned by a withdrawer. So, Scott, what do you what do you what do you got there? Because you've always got something fun once I share. You know, first of all, I just want to say I have been hearing this in the work groups I teach nonstop for like the last month. So clearly this topic needed to come up. Oh, that's um, right. I have heard the roommates thing repeatedly. Um, and usually yeah. it's, you know, I, I work with the addicts when I teach my, my online work groups. And I'm, they will say, my wife says, it feels like we're roommates now. And they're really hurt because they feel like they're holding up their end of the bargain other than the whole cheating, infidelity, sex addiction thing. Um, well, and, and in, from their perspective, I've been working really hard in recovery. I'm a new person. Right. How can you tell me we're just roommates? Like I'm given everything I got to this relationship. Yeah. And in point of fact, they're usually not. They're usually withdrawing. Well, well sure. But I guess the, the, the piece they're missing is one, they're taking it personal. Right. And, that, and, and it's hard to try and describe to somebody. It's like, don't take it personal. And they always want to be like, screw you. You know how hard it is to not take it personal? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, actually, it's really hard. But because when their wife says, in this case, their wife says, we're just roommates, it's her way of saying, I'm lonely and I want to be closer to you. Now, imagine if you if he is able to hear that, that's a beautiful thing she's saying. I'm lonely and I want to be closer, right? Why is he taking that personal that she's saying, I want more, I want to be closer. I want to be more intimate in the relationship. Anyway, yeah, keep going. Yeah, no, no I, to I totally agree with that. But what I'm seeing from some of these guys is they, you know, once they recognize that, yeah, they were withdrawing and now they try to change the role and they become the pursuer and the pursuer becomes the withdrawer because the what, they, what the new pursuer doesn't understand is the new withdrawer doesn't feel safe in the relationship yet. So roommates are what they can handle right now. Sometimes, and, and sometimes it's, well, we probably need to explore together what pursual looks like, right? Because in the case of like sexual compulsivity, for instance, pursuer was, what do you mean? I pursue you all the time. I want to have sex, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, but if sex is unsafe, well, you say we're roommates, but if we're having sex, we're no longer roommates, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, but let's figure out how to pursue in ways that don't feel threatening. Yeah, and, and this is this is really my question, because I think the role switch feels threatening to both parties. I agree. And how can they 
set boundaries or what do they need to do to actually have this conversation? Like, I understand how you're feeling, but here's how I'm feeling. You know, I, it's, it's very confusing for them. And, you know, the guys I talk to, they're always saying, I feel like whatever I do, I'm wrong. You know, there's, there's no, I cannot win. You know, I was, I was withdrawing and she didn't want me to now I'm not withdrawing and she doesn't want me to. Um, and I'm, I'm not, saying anything bad about betrayed partners betrayed partners are going through their stuff and and they have reasons to respond the way they respond so please don't misread me i'm just telling you what i hear which is the guys feel like i can't win um what do you tell them <clears throat> well i actually think that one of my favorite emotions is confusion um when we notice that our partner um is having a response that we're not expecting and we experience confusion, it's an amazing thing to talk about, right? Because then I can say to my partner, hey, um, I have been pursuing you and the response isn't what I was expecting, right? Help me understand, you know, can we have a conversation? Because maybe my understanding of pursuing isn't your understanding or maybe now that i am pursuing it's just scary for you let's talk about why it's scary <clears throat> if that makes sense yeah i mean I'm, i i think about renee brown she did some research where she was looking at what women want from their husbands and, and the women were all complaining he's never vulnerable he's never vulnerable and then when the husbands became vulnerable, the wives freaked out. They're like, no, too, too much. I mean, there's there's a line here somewhere where we, we have to find a comfort zone. And is it different by couple? Is it different by person? Well, I think, I think it is different by couple. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's actually about having those conversations. It's about experimenting by trying things in, in pursuit uh, and then having conversation about how does this make you feel, right? Like, but the, the hard part is too often a withdrawer is so focused on fixing that it, they, get a, they get an idea in their head, I'm going to pursue. And then it's like, they're totally dejected when it didn't work out the way that they were planning. And it's like, this whole thing is an experiment. Like, why are you getting it in your head that it that it has to work out a certain way instead of I'm going to go try this thing and we're going to just see what happens. And then I can use whatever happens to figure out where to go. So that's where you learn not to take it personal as somebody who's a withdrawer or a pursuer for that instance or in, for that purpose. Like just I'm going to try and then see what happens. And then let's talk about what happened and what, what was different than what I might have expected, uh, what was uncomfortable for you that you maybe didn't expect. Like the, the key is to actually start having conversations around it, but it's terrifying for people. Like it, yeah. it's funny how often people will say, well, I want to have a conversation with my spouse about this. And I'll say, well, why don't you have it? They're like, oh, because, and it's like, well, then, then talk about why you're scared to have the conversation. It's just, yeah. it's funny how often we just both avoid it and not have any conversation because it's uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, so many couples, um, you know, it, it don't understand that emotional discomfort and dis disagreement and occasional actual conflict are how we get closer to each other it feels like i mean that's so counterintuitive but at the same time if i don't know what's going on in your head how can i know what's going on in your head and vice versa so yeah i um <laughs> i've been working on uh, i just just now started uh working on uh, like a sex therapy certification in addition, because I'm a sex addiction certified, uh, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm in the very beginning of a long road. And my, my supervisor actually said to me, you know, the greatest through the research, the greatest level of safety within like 
sexual groups of people is actually like the kink community. Yeah, because they because, talk. Because in order to engage in kink, you have to talk <laughs> before, during, and after to make sure that we both are on the same page, right? That's It's like because the behavior, uh, for lack of a better word, because I don't have a good one, could be considered very risky. Like you have to be, your communication just has to be so on spot on par like with you know with each other and so and it's like I, I've been thinking about that lately that it's like well you know if we're going to take something from a community you know let's take that like let's talk all the time and try to figure out what are you thinking what are you feeling what are your needs what worked for you what didn't work for you why didn't it work for you yeah and and the people I know in the BDSM community, in the kink communities, um, they actually get way more satisfaction out of the communication than the actual sexual yeah. behavior. Um, it's it's the communication where they feel vulnerable, yet understood, and and you know, and and vice versa. Um, and this is what in real life, though, we all tend to avoid. Um, Many of us do, unless yeah. you're a, unless you're a strong pursuer, because then you're like, no, no, I can't get enough. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Yeah. And even, but even pursuers can be like, give me, give me, give me too close, too close, too close. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's yeah. truth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Let's jump. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so let's jump into the Q and A. We, we only have one question. So ask us some more questions about pursuer, pursuee, withdrawer, or anything else um, to do with relationships. Yeah. Uh, so my sex addict partner frequently uses other people, projects, hobbies, et cetera, as an excuse to not be available for me. I feel resentment toward these people or inanimate objects or hobbies, even though they aren't even aware of what's happening. Is this intimacy avoidance? How do I, how do I get him to see I need to be a priority sometimes? He has had maybe one day of sobriety, one day of sobriety and puts little effort into recovery, though he claims that's what he wants. Uh, he is falling asleep as I write this question. Okay. A lot packed into that. Oh, yeah. There's a lot there. Um, here's, let's see, what should I start with? Um, so there, I mean, yes, there is, especially if you tell me that he's got maybe one day of sobriety. I mean, to be honest, that tells me you've got somebody who's just at best at the beginning of the recovery journey. Like it is not uncommon for people, even if they have sobriety to become busy uh, as a way of coping with life. Uh, and, and it has benefits. It has rewards. If I, uh, I think I've shared this with you before, but I, I actually went to my father's funeral uh, I don't know, five years ago, something like that. And people at the funeral were like, oh my gosh, he's the most kind. He serves everybody. He'd give, literally, he'd be the guy who'd give his shirt off his back. He helps everybody. And I remember listening to that going, who are they talking about? Because my whole life I've reached out to this guy and he'd only show up when he wanted to show up. Right. Like, and, and so um, it was interesting because that there are huge benefits to being busy and being used by other people, projects, hobbies, because you get like uh, some amount of connection. Uh, you get praise. Oh my gosh, I pre you appreciate you so much. You were willing to help me when no one else was. And you're neglecting your family, basically, but you're showing up for strangers almost um and so is it intimacy avoidance well it's intimacy avoidance with you <laughs> meaning it, it might be he he enjoys the the shallower level of intimacy that he gets with other people he enjoys the praise the appreciation um and it, and it could be a coping mechanism that allows his sobriety to be as good as it is even though 
it sounds like it's struggling. Um, but that is not uncommon as a way of people to avoid their emotions, is to be really busy. Um, I, I remember growing up, I used to hear a phrase in church, like it's like the person who has warm bread, but cold heart, cold hands, cold hearts, right? Like they're, they're the person that's willing to cook a loaf of bread, but they're not there for you emotionally, right? Like, and so that, that may be what's happening here. Um, how do I get him to see I need to be a priority sometimes? The hard part is he might think that you are a priority. He might be the, be the type of person who says, are you kidding me? Of course you're a priority. Why else do I work so hard to provide for the family? Um, the, the issue you have here is that his version of making you a priority doesn't match yours. And so how do you teach him that for you to feel like a priority, you're needing something different? And the question is, is he willing and able, right? One, is he willing? Two, is he able? Like, like there's, it's like that weird space of you can teach him all you want. You can tell him all you want. But if, he, if he's unable, he doesn't know how, he's too scared, he may never. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to doom and gloom you here, but like with, the, with what you're putting out in the question, you know, sometimes... Sadly, I've had to tell partners like, well, keep moving forward with your recovery and hopefully he gets it. Uh, but of course, there's always the possibility that he doesn't. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think I even laugh when you're like, he's falling asleep as I write the question. My guess is you're like, hey, come watch this webinar. Matt's amazing. I'm, Scott's amazing. You know, there, and, and he's just like, oh, yeah. You know, like, and, it, and it's like, here you are watching him disconnect, but you're saying, oh, if you could just watch this webinar, if you could ask a question, I would feel like a priority. I would feel like I matter. Right. And so here, once again, maybe he, it just, he doesn't realize he's like, oh, you're dragging me along to one more thing. And it's your way of saying, no, show me you love me. Anyway, I, I think that's about all I got, unless you got yeah. something else on that, Scott. Well, I, I have some, but type some more questions in. We're, we only have the one, so it's going to be a That was it, guys. We unless did you guys get, all, get busy with us. Um, can you talk a little bit about attachment styles? Because some people truly can only give or receive so much. You know, those of us who were enmeshed or those of us who had detached parents, you know, we become... You know, we can only handle so much. And when we're challenged out of our window of tolerance, we do things like, oh, oh, you know, this may not be he's tired. It may not be he doesn't want to be there. It may be it's too much for him right now. And this is what happens is he shuts down. Um, you know, sometimes I get very sleepy when I shut down. Um, I also get very sleepy when I'm, I'm like feeling safe. You know, I go into a 12 step meeting and you know, they're reading the preamble and I'm falling asleep because I feel safe for the first time all day. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> probably not the situation here. But can you talk a little about attachment styles and where that comes from and why, um, you know, why we behave the way we do? And then maybe, you know, how do we stretch somebody's comfort zone and stretch our own comfort zone so we can actually have some overlap? Yeah. So the, the coveted uh, attachment style is, is, is a secure attachment, right? There, yeah. there, were, there were four of those. I haven't met any of them, but I hear there are four. There are people, four. There four people in the world who are securely attached. Well, actually, the research says 50%. I know. And I'm going to tell you, I, I, was, I was telling a group of people last night, I was doing a, 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 a seminar, basically, a couples group. And... And the, I was like, the research is 50%, but I don't buy it. Well, then I just, just now, as you and I were talking about it, I said, you know what? Every time I do the assessments, not every time, frequently when I do assessments with somebody who struggles with sexual compulsivity, they actually score as secure. Because when you answer the questions, like, are you comfortable with intimacy? Are you comfortable... Uh, 
you know, being vulnerable to people. Well, the truth is, if I have an idea of what intimacy looks like, if I have an idea of what vulnerability looks like, I'm going to answer the question, oh, yeah, no, I'm comfortable with that. Not realizing that I'm answering the questions totally based on my perception. And when I really dig in and gain more understanding, so they, so they score secure, but then later in recovery, if they retake it, they realize, oh, I'm dismissive, right? And so I think, yes, people, um, people will score as secure, but like it's, it's a shallow security based on their lack of understanding. So, but anyway, you have the secure attachment, which means I have low anxiety when conflict arises and I have low avoidance when conflict arises. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not afraid to confront conflict and it doesn't spike my, my anxiety. Now, people who have low avoidance, but high anxiety when conflict arises, they're what we refer to as um, uh, preoccupied anxious. And the preoccupied anxious is a person who, for lack of a better way, I'm just gonna throw, it's like, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you, are we okay? Are you okay? Right? Because they are uncomfortable with themselves. And if they feel like the relationship is okay, then they can calm down. And then you have the bottom quadrant, which is anxious and avoidant. So they are the, avoid. Um, they are the fearful avoidant. And the fearful avoidant attachment is I'm not comfortable with myself. I don't, I don't trust myself and I don't trust other people. If I remember right, the research is like 6% of the population is fearful avoidant. Um, and the fearful avoidant is somebody who wants to connect. They want connection, but they're, they're scared. They're scared of being abandoned. They're scared they're not worthy of love and connection. Um, and then you have the dismissive, which they're like, I'm okay. Everybody else is crazy. I'm good with myself. Everybody else is crazy. And I, and I look at, a, there's a lot of people who struggle with addiction who that's actually how they feel. They're like, oh yeah, no, I'm good. Other people are just crazy. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, is that? Yeah, and this all comes from basically early life stuff. You know, the experiences we had, usually as infants and toddlers and, and through the early through maybe adolescence is these attachment styles form and kind of get set in stone although and usually because of how we're handled by our parents you know if they're inconsistent or if one parent is an addict or mentally ill or something you know we we just learn that you know to fear other people or to not trust other people or you know to not trust them all the time and we learn to take care of ourselves, which is why we become addicts. We learn to self-soothe with addictive behaviors. We can earn secure attachment. Correct. You, we so can, can you explain that process a little bit? Yeah, so so the pro, we can all, uh, well, I shouldn't say all. There is the possibility uh, that we can move to a secure attachment. I actually love to explain me, right? Like I... Uh, came into my marriage as a preoccupied, anxious attachment. Um, I, I, I wasn't secure within myself, and I would constantly look to my wife to make me feel secure. Uh, look for her validation. Look for her to tell me I'm enough. Look for her to approve of me. And over time, I had to come to understand that my anxiousness was trauma as a kid, was neglect as a kid. And just that constant desire of just not wanting to be alone. I'm much more comfortable. And at this point in my life, I've learned to be okay being alone. And so, in fact, sometimes I quite enjoy it. Um, and, and I had to realize and learn to soothe myself. And so in the, in the sense that once I feel as my, realize my anxiousness was coming up, there was a lot of times I would actually just call it out. I'd say, hey, hon, my anxious attachment is coming up. Um, in fact, one of my kids will even say that to me. Hey, dad, I'm feeling anxious attachy. 
That's what my kiddo, one of my kiddos says. I'm feeling anxious attachy. And I know that what they're saying is um, I'm feeling a little insecure. And I'm like, oh, cool. How do you need me to be here for you? Right. And so the difference is there's nothing wrong with needing a, like that attachment. In fact, it's beautiful. But if I can own that I need to own my insecurity and that I'm reaching to you, hey, would you mind showing up for me? Then I can learn to be secure learn to be secure with myself, learn to be secure that other people will show up for me. I just need to ask them to do it in healthy ways instead of demanding they show up for me in order to make me feel better. And manipulating them to show up for me in the way that I want them to show up for me. Correct. And yeah, and, and the way, you know, I think it's Stan Tatkins talks about, you know, to heal our attachment wounds, we have to attach, we have to risk attachment. Um, you know, we have to actually reach out and communicate, <laughs> I'm feeling insecure right now. And, yes. and, and then I'm when people feeling respond insecure. well, right. When people I, respond well, we build up some security. Right, and, and keep in mind, I have spouses who are like, okay, I'm, I'm out, like, you're, you're feeling anxious. Okay. I I'm not responsible for you. And it's not to like pull back. It's, Oh, cool. Thanks for telling me. Is there anything in particular I can do? And then I'm listening to see, am I willing to do that? Am I able to do that? Right. If, if my anxious spouse said to me, <clears throat> uh, I'm just trying to make something up like, Hey, um, I need you to give me a back massage. I feel like, again, I'm just trying to make something up. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not in a place where I can do that, but I can, we can lay down next to each other and just talk or you can lay down and, you know, I can, you know, I'll just sit here on the couch and, 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 and I'll put my hand on your back. Like you, you don't have to can like concede to whatever it is they need, but you don't need to pull away either. And that's where the, the anxious person in this scenario learns, well, I may not be getting what I need, but they're still here. And, and so I think it's really important that we're not trying to solve or prevent their, their uh, attachment issues. We're just trying to be present while they work through it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, while, we, while I was taking you down the attachment rabbit hole, Got a whole bunch of questions. So let's get to the questions. Um, my sex addict husband has been in recovery for three months. He has a CSAT, attends two groups a week, has an accountability partner that he checks in with daily. Um, we have been in a therapeutic separation for 10 months. Um, for the first six and a half months, he said he was in recovery, but used his group therapy as an excuse to see his affair partner. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I get triggered every time he says he needs to have a call with a group member. I want to be supportive, but I don't know how to talk to him about it. This is not, not that uncommon. And I totally understand why you get triggered. Matt, thoughts? Oh, gosh. I was like, ooh, anytime yeah. recovery is used in a way that it became becomes a weapon, ooh. Or, and so in this case. For acting out. But I'm going to a 12-step meeting and they go to the massage parlor. You know, oh, it's ooh. awful. Yeah, it, it, it creates such a painful situation. Um, how do you talk to him about it? I think that was ultimately your, your question. I think it's, it's learning to say, and this actually falls in line with, uh, with the attachment stuff we were talking about. It's learning to say, hey, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm feeling really scared uh, that you say you need to go make a call. And I think it's because of the past behavior where you've said that you're going to do something in recovery and you did something to act out and that terrifies me. And so I want you to know that I'm scared and that I I'm trusting that you're going to go do what you say you're going to do, but it's, it's scary for me. And then let them go do what they're going to do. And then you call a friend and talk about your fear you call somebody and get the support you need, right? So it's about being open about what's going on for you and uh, not like 
making an accusation that he's doing something unhealthy. It's not um, telling yourself that you're, you shouldn't, that you should trust and that you're being ridiculous. It's, it's learning to be in that place where, oh, of course I feel this way. And so I'm going to let him know I'm scared and I'm nervous. And then I hope he makes good choices. Yeah. And then I'm going to go get support. So yeah. I hope. And addict, you know, yeah. Addicts, if you want to help your betrayed partner with stuff like this, I mean, I've had uh, sponsees who were you know, doing this kind of thing uh, when they were supposed to be at a 12 step meeting. So they take a selfie, a timestamp, date stamp selfie of their feet in the meeting room every 15 minutes and send it to their wife. So the wife knows they're actually in a meeting. Um, at least, you know, the wife at least knows you're not at a strip club. The ugly carpet in the meeting room probably is not at a strip club. Um, so, you know, you can do things to start to re-earn trust, but well, yeah, and, that's, and, that's a tough one. And maybe even better, if if you have to go make a call to a member of your group, call it out by saying, hey, I know that this probably is going to trigger you because I've used therapy in the past as a, and, and to manipulate and do acting out behaviors, but I do need to make a call. And so uh, if that brings up this feeling of uh, insecurity, please tell me about it, right? So you can call it out before it happens for, in this case, for her. Uh, and that helps create a lot of safety because it's like, oh my gosh, he gets it. He sees me, right? So if you can call it out before it happens, that creates a lot of trust and safety for her. Yeah. And then you can show your call log afterwards. So, you know, your partner knows, yeah, he actually did call Joe, his sponsor or whatever. Um, or you okay, could I, ask, hey, would you yeah. like to see my call log? Would that be helpful? Right. Would yeah. you like me to take pictures of my feet in the meeting? Would, and, yeah. you know, I can include a couple other people's feet in the picture too. Would that be okay? Would that help you? So <clears throat> rather than just trying to, appease them right uh, you might want to ask hey would would this be helpful would you like this and that way they have the ability to say you know what i think that would or no i don't need that yeah yeah thank you for bringing up like, ask first um, right which which is always a good idea i'm unsure where to go to redevelop trust i've done everything i can think i can that i think is meaningful but when my wife needs to see me doing work I'm unsure exactly what I need to do. It's a mystery. But other than seeing me do something related to a problem I no longer believe I have, um, I just don't know how to ensure she trusts me. <laughs> a lot of, a lot, a lot in that one too. Oh, there's so many different places we could go. This is a good one. Um, so <clears throat> one, I think I would probably start off by asking her, what work uh, would make her feel would would make her feel more secure? But I'm asking not so that I can create a bullet list of things to go do in hopes that she feels better, but because I want to have a better understanding of what she feels insecure about. Um, the other thing is that I'm going to do is I'm going to ask her based on your question here, how much is it? How scary is it that I tell you that? I don't feel like I have this problem anymore. Does that make you trust me less? Um, if so, why? Right? Um, and, and then I would, I would ask, would it be helpful if I tell you things that I feel like I'm doing for work? Um, so I'm going to start exploring that whole, that whole thing. And it's not about creating a list and trying to check off all these boxes. I want to know more about what to her feels like work, what doesn't. What behaviors uh, have, have helped her feel safe that I'm working on and what doesn't. Because then I can get a better understanding of what trust building do I actually need to do. But if you're going to just try and check off a box or, okay, fine, I'm going to sign up for another meeting. Um, or I'm going to, I found a program online I'm going to work through as a way to build trust. I'm not sure that that's going to be effective. It might help, but now let's start having conversations about what trust actually looks like and what things leave her feeling like she can't trust. 
Yeah, and if you want to rebuild trust, you have to be trustworthy, number one. And I mean, it, this requires rigorous honesty, honesty all the time. Rigorous tell the truth, honesty. Tell the truth. Tell it faster. Don't wait for her to ask. You know, on on anything. Don't withhold. Don't tell her part of the truth. And also do this with everyone all the time. Don't just wife. Don't try to manage other people's emotions. Right. Tell yeah. them, hey, this is what's going on, and it may hurt your feelings or it may bother you, but this is the way I currently know how to process it. Yeah. Um, okay. How common or do you ever see a betrayed partner that is avoidant island and an addict that is more of a pursuer slash wave? And then the follow-up is, can a betrayed partner that maybe was a pursuer change to avoidant dismissive by being in a relationship with an addict um, before the addiction is known by the partner? So this, great. this is sort of the, the changing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. So first off, it's not uncommon for the betrayed partner to be avoidant in an island. And it's not uncommon for the addict to be more of a pursuer. Um, meaning, it's, I don't think it's the most common, uh, but I see it enough. Uh, and that's where somebody typically is using the addiction to calm their anxiety um and and they and the betrayed partner is more avoidant and then they use that as an excuse or have used it as an excuse to feed more into their addiction well only if they were more uh pursuant of me this wouldn't have happened right and so it, I don't know that it's super uncommon. I mean, just, but it's not like, I don't think it's, I think traditionally uh, the person with the addiction is going to be more of the, the withdrawer and uh, the betrayed partner is going to be more of a pursuer. Um, I think that answers that question, but I don't have statistics. I don't have specific numbers, but it's not so uncommon that I'm like, oh yeah, that rarely ever happens. It happens enough. Yeah. Uh, as far as your follow-up, um, changing yeah absolutely i think uh la the last research i saw was that a quarter of all people change their attachment style within a four-year period in a relationship and i and i think that's like involuntary it just it just happens yeah. uh, the cool part is, is it means that we can change we can change we can change our attachment style um i i have funny conversations with my wife when I first became a therapist um, she didn't like it because I wanted to diagnose her and I wanted to you know be her therapist not really but like that's kind of what happens when somebody becomes a brand new therapist um, and I would often tell her you're avoidant you're avoidant and and she'd be like no I'm not I, I think I was pretty secure I think I'm pretty secure well at, at one point years later she told me she goes honestly I might have been more avoidant because your anxious attachment was so high that it was overwhelming to me and so if I became avoidant it was because you're of your anxious attachment and I remember going she's probably right right like and so yeah absolutely we can shift um I have since become way more secure and, and she's probably moved back to being much more secure herself. Uh, but yes, so hopefully that answers the question. You could have totally, uh, or a betrayed partner totally could have changed to being avoidant and dismissive. Sometimes we call it a burned out pursuer. When a pursuer has pursued so much, so much, so much and never gets a response, they, come, they can become dismissive just because they're like, I'm so burned out. I have zero hope. Anything good will ever come of it. So why bother even trying? They look like they're dismissive and they're just a burned out pursuer. They're just like, why bother even? I've done everything I know how to do. Forget it. Not interested. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our attachment styles are set in place mostly by trauma um, or wonderfully secure parents. Yeah. Or um, nurture. <laughs> yeah, you know, nurture. Uh, but more trauma later on can obviously influence our our attachment style, um, which is what this question is about. Now, I noticed the, the, that she put in here, the relationship style changed before knowing about the addiction, basically. 
And the point I kind of want to make there is, you know, with sex addiction and infidelity, betrayed partners are traumatized before they know what's going on because the relationship is not right and they know it. Can you address that a little bit, Matt? I mean, I know it's a little off topic of this question, but I mean, there is trauma before the real trauma. <laughs> yeah, I mean, are you just, are you meaning, I guess I'm trying to understand, you want me to address how that can develop in childhood? No, 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 I'm talking about, you know, I'm in a relationship and I'm cheating and my wife doesn't know I'm cheating, but my wife does know that I'm pulling away and that money's disappearing. And, you know, I, I just am not as present as before. And she's traumatized by that. She's hurt by it. She knows something is wrong. Well, she's I probably see. blaming herself, you know, and well, that can impact the way she tries to attach. Right. So, so oftentimes you might have somebody who's secure uh, and because they have a partner who maybe starts having an affair and money's disappearing and they start working longer hours. Well, it's not uncommon for somebody to be like, oh, well, shoot, like, what do I need to do? Because that's all we have control over anyway. Right. And so if I sit there and I go, okay, what can I do? I, I want to, I want to pour more into my partner and I want to bring my partner back into the relationship more. And so maybe I'm not being kind enough. Maybe I'm not serving them enough. Maybe I'm not. And so what they do is they start leaning into, let me change who I am. Well, if that continues to go perhaps in a negative way and they're not getting the outcome they're looking at, and you have a partner who might be like, yeah, you're the one that needs to change. I wouldn't be acting this way if you weren't better, right? And these are the messages that are getting sent back and forth. Then they can totally develop into like anxious or avoidant or whatever, because all that stuff that's going on and they don't even know about the big trauma right, is sending messages and they're just grabbing onto those messages and internalizing it. And so they totally shift into losing themselves into tr in trying to save the relationship when they don't even really know the story uh, that, yeah, your attachment style and then you it totally shifts. Then you get hit with the big trauma and it's just like not it's just like throwing a tanker of gasoline and, and fire on top of a train wreck like it, so it's dirty yeah yeah and and just a little follow-up here yes I, I knew something that was wrong but I didn't know what and I think that happens a lot um anybody who's in that position um Michelle Mays has a book coming out I think within the next month or two called The Betrayal Bind uh, it's called The Betrayal Bind by Michelle Mays I think it's available available for pre-order um, I've read it already. She's got an entire chapter on that, and it's oh, it's brilliant. Cool. Um, so give give that an order um, and a read. Okay, <laughs> this is another follow up. So this is from the gentleman who was falling asleep. Says, so I am falling asleep. Um, thank you for admitting. Um, yeah, good ownership. That's great. Yes. Um, uh, it's partly because I've been working like a dog all day on projects that ultimately benefit her, meaning my wife. I feel like I'm prioritizing her in this sense. Am I failing to understand what prioritizing means to her, or is she failing to prioritize the important things within our household? Um, I ask this because I feel we should be working for us and not necessarily for her. Do you feel triangulated? Do you feel great. triangulated? <laughs> well, it's a great question, and this isn't yeah. actually uncommon when essentially what he's saying is, I feel unheard, I feel misunderstood. Um, and now what he what he's doing here is she's going to pick up on this as him being defensive because he's feeling misunderstood and unheard and he's trying to say hey can you hear me he's not actually being defensive in the sense that but but yet she's going to feel very dismissed by this response from him um, I love what I'm going to assume here is uh, a, a, a good humility. And that humility is that he's saying, you know, am I failing to understand what prioritizing means to her? Now, here's the jab he throws in, even though I don't think he's meaning to throw in a jab. It's, it's how it's going to feel to her. 
or is she failing to prioritize the important things within our household? And so what's happening is that he's saying, hey, I'm doing this for us. And she's like, no, you're doing it to make you feel better because it doesn't make me feel any better. Well, if you slow that down, he's saying, hey, and I'm going to make this up for a second because I have no idea what projects he's working on. No, you know, our back porch, the wood is rotting. And so I've spent a bunch of time getting that taken care of so that our, our house is nice and, and that the home value stays high. And ultimately, this is benefiting you. And she's like, no, that is important. I agree. But like right now, I'm so lonely. What I wanted you to do was to ask me or, or was to, you know, that I've been wanting to uh, build shelves in the pantry. And that would have been really important to me. And he's like, but that's not critical. The wood's rotting out there. And, you know, we're coming into rainy season. And, and she's like, yeah, but it can last another six months. We're going to have to replace it anyway. If you cared about me, you would have recognized I really need these shelves. You know, I'm just making this up if we're talking about projects here. Right. And so you might think, well, man, those shelves don't uh, benefit our household. It only benefits her. But that's where you've got to slow down and start to say, hey, help me understand why this project feels so much more important to you. Um, because I'm really nervous that if we don't do this project, this will be bad for us. So we start having conversations about that. And coming up together with what we feel is of our most important priority. And even though we may be a little bit off, okay, look, I want you to feel like you're a priority, but I also need to feel like I'm important too. How do we work together to try and achieve that at the same time? Instead of, well, you obviously don't understand what the bigger priority is. And if you, and if you understood, you'd clearly see that I care about you. And, I don't know if that. Um, I'm typing that really quick in here for somebody. Uh, they asked. Um, more importantly than you know, house projects, should this couple and should every couple sit down and prioritize the emotional aspects of their relationship? This is what I really want and need. This well, is so, a priority for me. So the funny thing is, we're all different, right? And so, like, if you look at like um the love languages book right like if you look at kind of the theory there is that to one person doing service projects around the house might actually be emotional love right to another person it's gifts to another person it's acts of service and and so on quality time right and so the, the it's tough because you might say like me personally a project around the house is never going to be like, oh my gosh, I feel so loved. I might be like, oh, hey, that's really nice. I like that. I might be like, I am so sick of projects around the house. It, all it does is take time away from you and I going on a date and you and I, whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so should couples actually discuss wow. their love language? This yeah, is absolutely. way more meaningful for me than that. <laughs> Right. But, and then we have to be understanding that the way I want to give you love might be very different than the way you want to receive it. And so then let's start having conversations and let me start asking questions to try and understand you instead of me making judgments. Well, you don't do it because you don't love me and you don't, you know, agree with me because you think you're more, you're smarter than I am. Right. And it's like, whoa. We're getting caught in all of our wounding here. Yeah. yeah, and and you know we don't always have to speak the same love language, but if I understand what your love language is, if I understand you retiling the bathroom is saying I love you and and I want to do you know, even if I don't give a shit if you retile the bathroom, I can at least recognize it as a gesture from your love language. Oh, it was. I have such a funny story about. It's actually taking tile out of the bathroom, uh, but we won't, it will, yeah. We don't, I don't know that we have enough time, especially if we're gonna try and answer. Do we have any more to answer? I think we got it all, so. 
So let's let, tell it very quickly about. Okay. Tenement. So 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 I'm gonna take I'm gonna take the long version of this real quick. I grew up watching the Andy Griffith Show. Did you watch it at all? V barely. Okay. So for me, if I stayed home sick from school, I think it would come on. You'd get like you'd get like Andy Griffith, Perry Mason, which I didn't totally love as a kid. You get Happy Days, and then you get like Price is Right. And then after Price is Right, it was like soap operas, which are boring as all get out, right? So, um, and I remember this episode where like Aunt, I always want to say Aunt May, but it wasn't Aunt May. It's Aunt B. Aunt B, there you go. Aunt B like goes out of town and she's about to come back in town. And I don't even remember why, but like they realized the house was too clean. She wasn't going to feel appreciated. She wasn't going to feel needed. And although we could talk about that and make that a whole separate topic, they ended up like putting dishes in the sink, squirting ketchup on them, like kind of making the house a mess so that she felt needed and wanted. And uh, it was so funny because one time, many, several years ago, my wife and my daughter went on a cruise with some of my wife's family members. And while I was away, while she was away, I had the boys and I, I changed my work schedule. So I was only working while they were at school. And when they were at home, we cleaned their room spotless. Our, I, ch I chipped out all the tile in the bathroom, cleaned up the bathroom floor, got it ready to be retiled. And I did all these things. My wife gets home and she's like, she was like, I feel terrible. And I'm like, why? She's like, you did all this stuff. And I can't do this when I'm home with the kids and you're working. And, and I'm like, I don't even understand. Like, I tried to do this because I thought it'd be awesome. And now you feel bad about yourself. And I didn't realize, well, one, shoot, I can do anything for a week. Like, I can bust my chops and be on 100% of my game for a week. But if I was in her shoes, like I'd be just as messy as she was in the whole life game. Does that make sense? And, I, and at the time, I just didn't even realize. So you talk about this, like, you know, tiling the bathroom floor for somebody to feel loved. Here I'm thinking like, hey, isn't this great? I did this because I love you. And now, to be honest, now she didn't have to because she was the one remodeling. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'd try to help. And, and so, and I didn't understand, but the, the funny thing about it is, is how we impact each other yeah. and realizing that like, sometimes we do things we love or pe for people we love and not realize that like, it might hit a wound of theirs. And my wife just needed to realize that if we switched roles, she does it way better than me, but <laughs> I do my role really well. <laughs> At least she didn't look at you and say, <gasps> I loved that tile. <laughs> that's oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So that's really, really funny. Yeah. So all right. Thank you. That that was a great way to, to bring this one home. So thank you, everybody. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Um, Matt, anything you want to say to take us out? Um, it's so funny because I actually was hurrying trying um trying to read the rest of the comments somebody's like did you have my childhood i don't know if they were talking about me or you i think, I, I think that came up when you were doing that whole tv sick at home routine <laughs> i could tell you how many times i can tell you about the anxiety i had as a kid it was so funny because my stomach would go crazy before school and i'd be like mom i'm sick She'd be like, okay, I guess you stay home. And then I'd feel fine. And then I'd just watch TV in the morning, if that makes sense. And I, I didn't realize I had anxiety. I just didn't want to go to school. But my body was like, nope, you're sick. Anyway, that's really funny. And then the other one was, you're both right. I am bitter at his acting out behavior. But I wish I would see how important, I wish he would see how his important recovery is to our entire household. We won't have one much longer if he doesn't start prioritizing not cheating and lying. Yep, I, that's, there you go. Um, I think that just got very well communicated. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. So anyway, I, all I'm going to send you guys out here with is if I were to throw something out, try to ask each other questions, try to get curious about each other and understand what are each other's priorities. 
and maybe how you guys can work together on each other's priorities. It's, it's such a hard thing you guys are going through. It really can be done. Uh, so keep, keep at it and we'll see you in two weeks and try to help even more then. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Matt. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. See ya. Have a great weekend.